What I want to suggest to you today from the life of Elijah is that the amount of the supernatural you get to see will be directly related to the level of your spiritual commitment. That if you are a part-time Christian, don't expect full-time miracles. We have discovered already that Israel is dealing with a problem that brought the prophet Elijah on the scene in the first place. And that is their attraction to idols. They were attracted to Baal and Asherah, Baal's girlfriend. The idols that had now consumed the culture, even those who name the name of God. So that is idolatry. You just have an American idol. You just look at what's happening in the culture and you gravitate to that, whether it's people or power or possessions or whether it's prestige, whatever it is, you are looking to that thing as the source of your provision. Now, when you understand that is the biblical definition of idolatry, then you understand that uh, you can be right here, right now, today, and be an idol worshiper. We come in chapter 18, and we come to a place where now the prophet Elijah confronts King Ahab. He confronts King Ahab and he confronts him in chapter 18, verse 17. And when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, is this you, you troubler of Israel? In other words, you getting on my nerves, Ahab says. Is this you, Elijah, you bringing all this trouble to Israel? Elijah responds, in verse 18, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have because you have forsaken the commandment of the Lord and you have followed the Baals. You follow the idols. So he refuses to be politically correct. He says, Ahab, you have brought this about because of your pursuit of idolatry. You've caused the heavens to shut up. It's no longer raining. The culture's in trouble because you have pursued another God. One of the reasons you're seeing all of this chaos around us, even in our culture and in our country, is because we have forsaken the Lord our God. America right now is undergoing what you might call the passive wrath of God. Romans chapter 1 talks about the passive wrath of God. It says, because they have no longer retained the knowledge of God, God turned them over. That is, he released them to the consequences of your choices. So therefore, what you and I are experiencing today, not only on a national level, but even on a personal level, is God giving you what you want, a life without him. But you have to understand when God gives you what you want, a life without him, there are deleterious consequences that come with that. And what you and I are experiencing today is God saying, you don't want me? Let me get out of the way and let me show you life without me. And so you have the consequence of the removal of God. So Elijah says, now send and gather to me all of Israel at Mount Carmel, verse 19, together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah, that's 850, who eat at Jezebel's table. He says, uh, okay, uh, let's, have a, let's have a fight at the OK Corral, okay? You bring your people and your God, and I'll be there at high noon, okay? Okay, let, let's settle this once and for all. Let's don't, let's don't confuse people. Let's, let's put this thing out on the table. So Ahab says, okay, you got a deal. Let's go for it. So Ahab sent, verse 20, a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Now watch this because this is where we start. Verse 21. Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you hesitate 
between two opinions. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Oh. Elijah says, all right, folk, how long are you going to keep dancing? How long will you hesitate between two opinions? He says the people were silent. They were not ready to commit. But watch it. They were always ready for a miracle. They were always looking for a blessing. They were always looking for God to do something while they were silent. So let me state my position as coming from this passage. If you're not ready to commit, and to stop dancing, stop looking for a miracle and searching for a blessing. He says that you want this God over here, that God over there, how many more sermons, how many more programs, how many more challenges do you need? They're halting between two opinions. God wants to know that you've taken your stand and that you've made your decision. When Jesus spoke about the church of Laodicea in the book of Revelation, he said, I would that you were hot or that you were cold, but you're lukewarm. If you are lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. Or to put it another way, you Christians, because he's talking to Christians, y'all make me want to vomit. So my question to you is, this week, when you live your life outside of church, do you make Jesus want to throw up? Because he sees you're not hot, you're not cold, you're lukewarm. While you pray for a miracle and ask for a blessing, while you dance between different gods. He says, how much longer are we going to play religion and not be fully committed? They said nothing because they weren't ready to make a full commitment. And yet he's calling on them just to do that. Jesus says to reject lukewarmness, to reject double-mindedness. Let not the double-minded man think he shall receive anything from the Lord. James 1.5. So now, Elijah says, I alone, verse 22, am left the prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Elijah says, I'm outnumbered, 450 to one. I'm out here by myself because the rest of y'all folk not supporting me. Y'all just saying amen, you ain't behind me. Y'all just, he said, he said, so I'm out here stuck by myself and I got 450 of that prophets. But since this is not a popularity contest, since this is not to see what the, how the numbers fare in my favor, I'm ready to take my stand. God is looking for some folk who even though outnumbered are willing to take their stand. Who even though the other side has more than you, even though it looks like you're outnumbered in your, among your friends, among your coworkers, or what have you, you are willing to be known as a follower of Jesus Christ. You are no longer going to be a secret agent Christian, a spiritual CIA representative, a co covert operative. He said, this is how the numbers shape up. But in spite of that, we're going to put the true God to the test. He says, why don't you bring, verse 23, two oxen and let the 450 choose one oxen and I'll take whichever one they don't choose, put it on the wood, put it on the altar, but don't put a fire under it. And then you 450, you call on the name of your God and tell your God, light the fire. Okay? Tell your God, be the Ohio players, fire. Tell your God to light it up. And then I'm going to call on my God. And let's see whose God is the God of fire. So they agree. 
He is so confident in his commitment to God that he will challenge the majority. And so here's what they do. The 450 agree. And so they chose the ox in verse 26. They took the ox and prepared it in the name of Baal. And from morning to evening, they were saying, oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice. No one answered. And they leaped about the altar which they made. So they're in there with their God. Oh, Baal, oh, Baal, let's have some fire. Light the, light the altar. Oh, Baal, oh, great Baal. They jumping around the altar. They're getting their praise on around the idol and nothing happened. And there was no voice. Now, this is where we get to a little humorous part in the Bible. It gets a little humorous here in verse 27. Because it says, at about noon, that Elijah mocked them. Okay, now it's 450 of them. And it's one of you. This ain't the time to be making fun of folk. But Elijah just standing there and he mocks them. And look at how he mocks them. He says, why don't you, why don't you call out louder? Uh, call out verse 27 with a loud voice. Y'all ain't screaming loud enough. He can't hear you. He says, um, but he is a God. Uh, maybe he's occupied. Okay? He's got another meeting going on and he can't get to y'all right now. So maybe that's why nothing happening. Or maybe he's gone aside. Now, gone aside means maybe in the bathroom. <laughs> gone aside means he's in the john. Or maybe he hasn't gone aside. Uh, maybe he's on a journey. He's on a trip. You know, he's taking a vacation. Or perhaps he's snoring. He says, maybe he's asleep and you need to wake him up. So why don't you sing a little louder, praise a little louder, pray a little louder and wake up your God. Well, all he did was tick them off because in verse 28 it says, they crowd out with a loud voice and they cut themselves according to the custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out of them. In other words, they didn't go on crazy. They have lost their minds trying to make their God do something. 450 of them. While the audience of the Israelites stayed silent. They had nothing to say, nothing to contribute. It was one man taking a stand. When midday was past, verse 29, they raved until the evening sacrifice. There was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come close. Come close. So all the people came near to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord which had been torn down. Okay, let me stop there. Let me stop there. It says he repaired the altar which had been torn down. That means they had religion without commitment because the altar hadn't been used. Now what would they do on the altar? Sacrifices. Why would they make sacrifices? To deal with sin. So what they were doing was having religion without dealing with sin. And so Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob to whom the word of the Lord had come saying Israel shall be your name. Mm. Let me say a word about these 12 stones. He put 12 stones around the altar according to the 12 tribes of Israel. Now the question is why? Well the answer to the 12 stones is found in Joshua chapter 4 verses 21 to 24. In Joshua chapter 4, 21 through 24, Joshua has just crossed the Jordan River. God has supernaturally opened up the Jordan River so that they could cross on dry land. In other words, they had just come through a miracle. When they came through the miracle, God told Joshua, I want you to make a memorial and I want you to put on the memorial 12 stones. 
12 stones, one stone for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And here's why. So when your children ask you, what do these 12 stones mean? You will be able to testify to the next generation about the God who brought you over. The problem with many of us is we have nothing to tell our children because we've not seen anything ourselves. We don't know that God is a miracle working God, so we just give platitudes we heard in church. He's my wheel in the middle of the wheel, my rose of Sharon, my bright morning star. He's so high you can't get over, he's so low you can't get under, he's so wide you can't get around him. Uh, we just talking noise, we just talking smack. We haven't seen what he can do. We can't testify that these 12 stones have a historical reality and the same miracle working God, even though you're in a different Different scenario is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He's still doing miracles today for the fully committed. So if you really want to see this miraculous working God, you must make a decision. I must make a decision. We must make a decision, which means we can't keep playing church. They were, they were playing church, but they weren't seeing anything. So the prophet comes along, and here's what happens. He took the 12 stones, verse 32. So with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. He got the spiritual priority back in order. And unless we do that as a church, unless that's the main thing, every other thing is a waste of time. He got the altar back, the spiritual part back. The confession of sin and the pursuit of righteousness back. The altar represented all that. And then he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two measures of seed. So he digs this hole around the altar. Now watch what he does here. He arranges the wood, verse 33, cuts the ox in the pieces, lays it on the wood, and he said, fill four pitches with water and pour it on the burnt offering. Now wait a minute. If you're trying to light up something, you don't pour water on it. You're not trying to pour water on it. You want to keep it dry so that it lights quickly. But he pours water on it. Oh, but that's not all he does. Because according to verse 24, it says, he says, do it a second time. So they pour water on it. They wet the wood, wet the ox, wet everything. He says, pour four more pitches on it. So, war, okay, he does it again. Oh, but is he finished? No, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the third time it says there was so much water that the water flowed around the altar and also the trench with the water. So not only was the wood wet and the ox wet, the trench around the whole altar was filled up with water. In other words, he said, I'm not only going to tell you I believe in God, I'm going to show you how bad God is. That we're going to make it hard for God to do a miracle. But when you got that kind of relationship <laughs> where you can make it hard for God to do a miracle and still not sweat it because you, you know who you're dealing with. Because, see, I think a lot of us don't know who we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. See, we don't know who we're dealing with. That's why we need other gods, not knowing that to take the other god is to lose the true god. And so he makes it hard for God. Now, he comes to his prayer. So he prays. And he prays. At the evening sacrifice, O Lord, verse 36, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the covenant-keeping God, today let it be known that you are God in Israel. I am your servant, and notice this, I have done all the things at your word. Let it be known what you will do when people are committed to you and your word. So, he says, I have kept your word. Answer me, O Lord, verse 37, that this people may know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back again. And the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering, the wood, the stones, the dust, and licked up the water in the trench. Now, this is one of the scenes I want to see on instant replay when I get to heaven. Because it not only said the fire fell, it consumed, watch this, it consumed the wet ox. Okay, I can understand that. But it says it consumed the stones. 
the wood and the stone. But here's the part I like. It said it licked up the water around the trench. So after it sucked up the oxen, sucked up the stone, sucked up the wood, it went around the trench. It just licked up the water. In other words, God showed off. That, that's what God, God would just show it up. Oh, Elijah, let me, let me do my thing. Let me show you what I can do. Let me, let me stick my tongue out and lick it up. Let me just, let me just lick it up. He showed off. Oh, and when you see God show off and show out for you, when you see him do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think, when you see because you've rebuilt the altar a full commitment, he say he saw it. <laughs> and then the people saw it. They fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Does anybody here know what a... Um, hillbilly road bump is. <laughs> Let me tell you about a hillbilly road bump. A hillbilly road bump is an armadillo dead in the middle of a road. <laughs> that, that's what's called a hillbilly, I mean, country people call it a hillbilly road bump. Okay? Now let me explain. One half a million armadillos every year are killed in the middle of the road. Every time I've seen an armadillo, it's on his back and his legs are sticking up in the air. Every time I see an armadillo, it's dead in the middle of the road. Because here's what they do. They start crossing the road. They stop in the middle of the road. They, they stop in the middle of the road with cars coming. How stupid can you be? They stopping in the middle of the road with cars coming and they get run over. They get run over because they get comfortable in the middle of the road. Does God have any hillbilly road bump Christians in this place? Does God have any hillbilly road bump Christians? You come to church and you stay in the middle. You like Malcolm in the middle. You stay in the middle. You want to be able to step over here to the God of the Bible, but you want to stay over here to the world. You stay in the middle only to be run over by his glory when he moves down the center. But if he can ever get you to go all the way, heaven will open up. You will see heaven open, Jesus said. You will see the angels of God going up and down the Son of Man, and you will see what God can do because you've given him all you have. God is looking for some folk who are going to leave the middle and go all the way. We are looking at the life of Elijah to discover the supernatural and I don't want you to miss the point. His name means Yahweh is my God. This woman had every reason not to believe because the money was funny. She had every reason not to believe because she's down to her last meal. But because the word of God through the prophet of God was delivered to her, she now has the choice. Do I settle for my last meal or do I believe the word of God? The answer to the question is, do you want the supernatural or do you want to live on what you can see and the flower you have in your hand? When you are convinced that what comes from this pulpit or any pulpit for that matter is truth from the word of God. Now that's the criteria, not, not the preacher, but it's truth from the word of God. The question now is, are you going to act on it? Because nothing happens for this woman until she moves.